Hello, everybody. Before we start this episode of the MinMax Show podcast, the folks at Fixture Gaming wanted to let you know about the Fixture S1. The Fixture S1 is a clip that you put on your Nintendo Switch Pro controller so that you can play on the go with the best Switch controller. You actually slide the screen into the top and you can play in the best way. You can check out the Fixture S1 on Amazon or on Fixture's official website, and you can use the promo code MINMAX for $5 off when you purchase the Fixture S1. And on top of that, you can get the Fixture Gaming carrying case. And because the folks at Fixture Gaming are very sweet and generous, they surprised me by making a custom MINMAX version of the Fixture S1 with wonderful MINMAX logo. I don't know where they pulled this from or how they got this, but I'm amazed. And you can win this if you share this episode the MinMax Show podcast or your favorite MinMax video or podcast on Twitter and use the hashtag MinMaxFixture. We'll randomly select somebody within the next week to win the custom MinMax Fixture S1. So if you want to support MinMax, you can support the folks who support us by going to Fixture's website and using the promo code MinMax for $5 off the Fixture S1. Thanks so much, everybody. Here's the show. Everybody and welcome to a new episode of the MinMax Show podcast. I'm Ben Hansen, and I'm joined today by Jeff Marchiafava. Hello. Hello. And Kyle Hilliard. Hi. And Jana Garcia. Hello. And that's not it, because we're going to keep this party train a rolling, this indie train a rolling, as some people say, because we're swapping some folks around because we have this crew to talk about the Switch. OLED, OLED. I guess I haven't said it out loud yet. What's the what's the most common cool way to say that, Janet? Do you know? Um, probably just switch OLED. But someone on TikTok commented and they said I call it the Swoled, and I love it very that good. so much. Very good. We'll be talking about that. Wait, a little bit about Swoled. Well, that's also good, Kyle. We'll talk about all that fun stuff. <laughs> We're going to talk about uh, Mario Golf, a little bit of golf mop up, which. In my mind, the three most interesting words in the English language, golf mop up. Uh, then we're going to be joined by Leo Vader. We're going to talk about some Assassin's Creed news, which is interesting. Um, and then we're going to be joined by um, a very special guest, uh, the designer and developer of Chicory, A Colorful Tale, one of the best games of the year so far. I would argue Janet would argue that, yes. Yeah, it's my number one. Number one. So Great. Okay, so yeah. we're finally mm, going to talk about default, Chicory. dethroned. It did. It finally did. So we'll be talking about Chicory. Um, we're sharing our thoughts on that, and we figured, well, we might as well invite the designer to come on and, and talk with us about it. So it should be a fun time. It's not too often we have a developer on the show, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, then we have some fun community questions in the back half of the show, of course. A lot of good stuff, Jeff. I mean, you're not going to believe what's coming up. I'm ready. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, also we should point I mean, out... You you also just told me everything that's coming up, so I guess I can <laughs> believe it. There will be some surprises and community questions. Oh, okay. But uh, we should point out that if you're listening to this or watching this and saying, what is wrong with them? I don't understand. Why does Kyle have such long hair? Why is Jeffem so smiley? Why aren't they talking about Deathloop and the state of play from Sony and all those announcements there? Um, we recorded this before that, but if you want to see us react to the new state of play, which is happening uh, Thursday afternoon for us from Sony, um, you can check out our reaction stream over on our YouTube channel, which has changed its URL. And that might not be too confusing or clear for a lot of people it's all over the place but what it is is basically our url for our old youtube channel used to be minmax show but through a series of very fortunate events we were actually able to claim minmax now so the point is if you want to watch us react to the big state of play from sony you can go over to youtube.com slash minmax and check that out and uh, subscribe while you're there we appreciate it yeah update that bookmark oh so yeah update that bookmark yeah i guess i had to do that too okay the switch oled um <laughs> this is a funny is it funny janet is it funny to tell the story of the saga of the switch oled or is it just sad it's it's numbing i think at this point that's where i am at with yeah. it because it's like i'm like am i should i should i be mad should i feel something I mean, and i'm like you know just do whatever you're gonna do <laughs> you know like it's fine just just sell your switch and just it's fine i don't know why 
I don't know. I have so many emotions. Where are y'all at with this? Should I be mad? I think is like the perfect emotion, right? Because the announcement came. It was like early morning and my I was very tired and I was like, this is how they finally dropped this thing that was hotly anticipated. And then I looked at it and I'm like, oh, well, it's not that thing that they never did actually promise or make any indication that was going to exist. That all came from outside sources. So it's like, so I'm not... It's I should I'm not allowed to really be disappointed, but I am. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a step back. Let's take a step back. For literally years, there have been the rumors about the super powered switch, about an upgraded switch, kind of the equivalent of like a PS4 Pro, Xbox One X for the switch. A new 3DS. If you That's will. right. Some would say. Um, and then rumors were lit on fire before E3 where Bloomberg got out there, I think it was Michael Bloomberg himself, and he stood on the edge of a building and he said, hear ye, hear ye, before this here E3 begins, you will see the fabled Switch Pro, as now people just call it, the super-powered Switch. Uh, E3 started, we didn't see it. E3 ended, we didn't see it. Now, post E3, Nintendo has a big announcement about Switch hardware, and we still don't see it. Because what this is, is it's a Switch but instead of a 6.2 screen, it's got a 7-inch screen now, and it's an OLED screen. It's white. The stand is rounded off a little bit. It's 32 gigs. There is a red to... and blue version, by the way. Okay. It wasn't in the trailer. Okay, yeah. good to know. It's got 32, uh, instead of 32 gigs uh, internal storage, it has 64. There's a couple of the details we can get into, but by and large, this is not the Fabled Switch Pro. This is basically a Switch with a slightly bigger nicer screen but the exact same guts running this thing it's still gonna chug like a mother for every third party port that's coming to this thing uh ethernet port did you mention that you I did did i just okay yeah that's the other upgrade is it has an ethernet port now so you don't and you can buy USB the dock separate port. too if you did want just the land support yeah so it's well, kyle you sound like you're already resigned to getting this yeah he I loves mean... it he can't stop talking about it I'll, I, you know, I had a joking tweet that was like, I don't need this, but I will be buying it. But the further I get away from it, I think I might actually not buy it. I think I might Good pull move. it off. We'll see. I, I don't want to get too ahead of myself here. I feel like not buying it would be a flex. So I kind of want to not buy it specifically <laughs> for the flex because I don't want to be. I feel like I've done so many dumb things in my life with gaming <laughs> stuff. And some of it, I'm like, you know what? It's for the love of the game. We justify. I'm like, oh, it's it's for work. If I didn't have this job, I wouldn't be like this. But the fact is, I am, I do have this job, and I am like this. So we kind of have to acknowledge that at a certain point. But yeah. for me, I think, um, you know, will I buy it? I think no, only because I have the Crossing Switch. If I didn't have oh, the Animal yeah. Crossing Switch, I absolutely would buy it. But and I don't want to be that. Some people like, and I know some people like this. I don't know if y'all do. Who have the home switch and the to-go switch i ain't doing all that i'm not switching who are you friends with millionaires that's insane I'm one one of those people. People. what yeah, why, no, why? Just, how complicated is it because it sounds complicated uh i mean i kind of commit to a game on a platform so to speak you know like I'll, i'm gonna play this fully here or i'm gonna play this fully there i just really like the switch light a lot like that is my favorite switch because i play it predominantly handheld like almost exclusively I play switch handheld and the switch light is light as its name implies. And it feels good in my hand. And uh, I mean, it's, it's really like if I can convince my daughter to play something with me, then I'll go over to play it on a TV. And that's about it at this point. And like in some ways that would make the OLED more attractive to me because I do play predominantly handheld, but I just like the light so much. I don't, I don't think I, I don't think the OLED is going to be a better experience than the light, even though it's going to have a better screen. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. I am not really budged to buy it. I think the white looks kind of cool, but this thing is three fifty, So it's $50 more than the standard switch. Um, I did run a Twitter poll to see where everybody else was at for the big switch OLED, which I just love that. That's what they call it. Like just as vanilla of a name as you can get. Um, so Twitter poll, will you be buying the Switch OLED? Uh, yes was 11.2%. No was 67.5%. And maybe was 213 So, you know, if they go a couple more years without another announcement, maybe more and more people will jump up to this one. But I think, and Jeff, I don't know if you're in this camp, but it seems like everyone was ready to go. This was 
a confusing detour and now we're back on the switch pro rumors and we realize that there's just <laughs> no getting off of this train because probably they are prepping something and that's where these rumors yeah. are coming from yeah polygon had a good article kind of breaking down the potential psychology behind this decision from Nintendo. And one of the things that people have been pointing out is like when you look at the Game Boy, there were about 10 different versions of this. They they usually they used to like come out with a new version of a handheld every year. And so no one should be taking this as like the Switch Pro is dead. Yeah. The other the other thing that they brought up was that it someone said that this seems like Nintendo has been working on a Switch Pro and that the the chip shortage that everyone has been suffering from has probably been hanging over their heads and they probably had the screen ready. They probably had all of these other designs ready and they've just been waiting on 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 actual chips, you know, NVIDIA to come up with the chips that they need. And they finally just said, you know what, screw it. We'll just do this as a stopgap you know, a bigger, prettier screen, and then they can add the new chip in a year or two when the shortage is over. And then come up and with those, a different those, name for it. Yeah, and those both seem like totally plausible theories to me. A lot of people yeah. are jumping to that conclusion, and I think that makes sense, but who knows what's really going on? I mean, always, always, always the takeaway is you can never predict Nintendo. <laughs> I could have given you 30 versions of a guess and you never would have come up with, yeah, the Switch Pro is actually just a Switch OLED and it's the exact same guts. It's just an absurd idea. And so the idea of being like, oh, I think I know what's going on with their manufacturing and with the chip supply. Like, obviously everybody's shortchanged, but the idea that they would just keep the same guts because of that chip shortage, but ship it with the new screen, it's possible but i think it's too easy of a solution for an unpredictable nintendo for everybody to be like oh yeah that's exactly what happened yeah i, w I would never say that's exactly what happened and nintendo in the same sentence yeah yeah <laughs> i'm currently going down like a game boy advance rabbit hole because i've gotten a, a physical copy of golden sun and then i have a micro and i have a two game boy advance sps in Jesus my house christ and one of them as it's just the or like the launch model that just has like basically a flashlight at the bottom of the screen to light the SP screen. But one of them is like an LCD screen, right? And in the past, when that Game Boy Advance system launched, it was pretty invisible. Like they just kind of swapped out the screen and didn't really make a big fuss about it. It was a different era. Maybe they were and I just didn't notice. And, and I, it this almost feels like that. You know what I mean? Where it's like they just had to, they just changed it almost arbitrarily and like maybe in a different era, Nintendo wouldn't have even made an announcement about it. Like, oh, yeah, if you buy a switch now, it just happens to have a better screen because the OLED technology got cheaper or something like that. But, you know, it's a different age. So now they can kind of they can talk about it and they can add 50 bucks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I am yeah. stunned by like the exact same battery life. It's still the exact same window. Like so many of these things, it feels like are just kind of like, well, even though it's the same, technically you should bump a couple of these things up a little bit, but oh no, no, still, I mean, handheld, it's still going to be 720 docks, still going to be 1080, no bumps there. And so, yeah, I think a lot of people are trying to look to Nintendo's history for examples. And a lot of people are, I think rightfully pulling on like the, oh, this is like the 3DS XL. That's, that's what's going mm -hmm. on here. And we're still waiting for that new 3DS, which back in that era, it was, two and a half like a two and a half year gap between the 3ds xl and the new 3ds i don't think it'd be that long for this before the real switch pro emerges it's like the real mandarin if you're a marvel fan like at some point the real switch pro will come out and play the other theory that people have brought up trying to understand what the hell nintendo is doing is that they they've pointed out that nintendo uses new versions of mobile of their mobile devices to kind of continue these you know, you know like a set a steady sales trend for their mobile devices and that's like once the sales start dipping that's when they come out with a new version and it and like that just hasn't happened yet with switch like the switch has been a constant best seller and they've been selling as many units as they can make for this yeah. long so i'm i i think we'll we'll finally see that big switch pro reveal when the switch actually starts you know, or stops selling or i mean it's a fun race though between and this is my definition of fun it's a fun race between the chip shortages but then also like the production of breath of the wild 2 
because you would think they would want to sync that up just to be able to show off technically some real improvements with Breath of the Wild 2. And so I don't know if you all are in the same camp, but I assume they're going to try and maybe line those up for when Breath of the Wild comes out. Uh, see, you're, 2022 you're doing the thing again. Now, it I, would make sense for think, Nintendo to do this thing, so therefore it'll likely happen, right? <laughs> it's uh, it it doesn't make for as good content, but I'm ready to just throw everything out and yeah. to just live my life. Like that's where what I'm are at you because about? The, the the theories are interesting, and I think like the oh, there's a chip shortage, so they did this stopgap thing. It is an interesting theory, but I think that's. Like, I'd be shocked if that was true, because that seems so last minute. Like, yeah. they're in the fa- like, they're making it like, hey, do you have the chips yet? Oh, no, I thought you were getting the chip. Let's just put it out. That seems so, so last minute that I, I would be kind of shocked if that was true. And then especially when you add in like the, or, you know, the, some of the more like reputable rumors, which like how reputable are the rumors or they weren't true. I don't know. That's up for y'all to like feel out. But like when the Switch Pro rumors were hitting like really concretely, you know, with like Bloomberg's reporting and all these other reports that came out. That was based on, you know, allegedly, oh, we know, we heard from, we have a source. Yep. This is happening. The, oh, that's when they suddenly like, take all the chips out? Like, four, can they just like, oh, let's remove this last second. Just, just, you know, something's not adding up here. And I feel like the kind of underlying thing is some people claim that they know, and it turns out they didn't. You know, they were wrong. Like, that's just, we got to deal with that. So now, like, when I, if I do hear about Switch Pro, Switch 2, why should I believe it if it was wrong last time? And I'm not saying that like, oh, I'm never yeah. going to believe any rumor or like, I, you know, we talk about on the show all the time, like more or less reputable rumors based on the sourcing of those rumors and the track record of those people. I mean, this is a negative. This is a hit against the track record of like Bloomberg, for instance, yeah. in terms of this specific story. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I think with the quiet updates too, like with what you were mentioning, Kyle, like they did that with the battery life. Right. Like that right. new model of the switch. They just quietly did that. So. I don't think this is that I feel like I don't think Switch Pro is going to happen ever. I think Switch 2 will happen before Switch Pro, because when I look back at the history, there's never been like a souped up significantly more powerful SKU, really. They do these little tweaks and they tweak it down, but they don't really the idea of like the the PS4 Pro, but Nintendo version. I'm like, why did I, why did I believe it's, that? Because it's new 3DS. It's new 3DS yeah, where new you 3DS, need this to play Xenoblade like, and Minecraft. I, like, you could make an argument for as well, you know? Mm, you, but, I, mean, I, just, you I don't think it's a significant it. enough Point. jump. I don't, I don't yeah. think new 3DS XL is as significant as what Switch Pro was allegedly going to be. I think that those are really big gaps. Yeah, but. yeah, that could be. And so this, this whole weird thing is coming out October 8th, uh, October 8th, which is the same day as Metroid Dread. Uh, it was funny, like, just that trailer really made me laugh, like seeing this guy and it looks like he's seeing, you know, the gates to heaven open in front of him. He's like, whoa, whoa. And then it shows his screen. And he's playing like a 2D Metroid, which I think everybody agrees looks fun. But like visually, it's like, it's fine, oh, I'm gonna I guess. Play it. But oh, that's man. the only way to play it with that OLED. It, also, it does a that, brush like, under the rug a little bit. Everyone who is like Breath of the Wild 2, that that footage looks like it's only on a yes. Switch Pro, which I always was like, I don't know where you guys are getting that from. <laughs> well, it's because they uploaded it at 1080 Kyle, which I do think is interesting that the trailer is yeah. at 60. But apparently that was running on a PC or something or hardware to come. So the Switch Pro rumors roll along and we'll, uh, we'll be here for every step of the way, Janet, never, reporting never. on every new bubble that <laughs> pops up to the surface. Yay. Um, and Jeff, um, you on your new Switch OLED can play even more Mario Golf. Super Rush. Yes. Okay. You were very excited about this. Uh, Maybe more than anybody else. Uh, It's blurry, but... (laughs) Yeah. What do you think about it? I I don't get why more... I mean, I guess I do get why more people aren't talking about it, but this, like, I have had so much fun with Mario Golf, and it seems like just no one else cares. Yeah, we don't care that you're having I don't, fun. I don't understand. And what gave you that idea? <laughs> I do not know where this is coming from. It's. I started it uh, after, you know, you two were like lightly positive about it last week, uh, Kyle I want to clarify that I, I'm very positive on okay. it. I was just holding back last week because <laughs> we wanted it to be a short segment. But I really like the game How a lot. How long does it take to I say I like that. the game a lot? Okay. You don't have to be cagey just to get make it short. I wanted to tease for this week. <laughs> oh boy, I'm sure people on the fence about playing it appreciate that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I started it and I'm a little underwhelmed. Like, I like the GameCube version a lot, but I realized like I've never really gotten super into a Mario Golf game, I guess. But it it is a Mario Golf game. But Jeff, it's just that recipe is still doing it for you? Yeah, I mean, I th- I think 
I like the I like the concept of video game golf more than I like actual golf. Oh yeah. But even this like even even that said, like a lot of golf games are just too slow and they get a little boring and it's too long to play a full course or whatever. And I feel like Mario Golf has managed to make golf actually fun and and make video game golf even more fun. And I, I was super surprised by the speed golf mode that that is like, wow, I never want to play like a normal mode again in a video game <laughs> because of this one you're actually running up to the ball and like do you like playing it with other people or is this fun to even play single player oh i've been playing the adventure mode right which which it is way more detailed than i expected to <laughs> like like they they put way more effort into that than there there's a whole story and i'm living with toadette and charge and chuck because we got dreams of becoming pro mario golfers it is a funny premise of like okay let's get the freaks from the mario universe like they're in this clubhouse trying to make it to the big leagues in golf to maybe be able to play with the legs of a mario or oh fingers crossed waluigi someday i also like that there are courses where it's like uh there's eight, nine holes just here like <laughs> right. you just have to hit all the holes you're not leaving you're not heading you're just like just Get them in as all these nine holes in forty shots. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. It's they they've come up with weird, interesting variations on that core thing. And I and like I said, like I, I've I've been surprised by how little like most golf games are really in depth, and they let you they they basically let you cheat your way through the entire match, where it's like you can line up things absolutely perfectly so that like. The ball is is aimed right at the pin, and as long as I press the the button exactly at the meter when I'm supposed to, like I know where it's gonna go. Right. And this one, like they strip a lot of that out, and you actually do have to just kind of size it up and shoot as best as you can. And it's still it's still easy enough that you can get accurate, but that's what makes the speed angle of it so much fun. Where it's like, okay, well I have to do that, but I have to do it as fast as possible. And that kind of adds like in you're challenging yourself in that to to do it as fast as you can and you invariably make mistakes while you're doing it. And that has just kind of refreshed my love for the idea of video game golf, which has never yeah. been that exciting to begin with. But it does feel like a little more streamlined just with like the actual hitting. It's no longer like the three button press classic video mm-hmm. game golf thing. Instead, it's just like, ah, just hit the A button once when you're at this marker and that'll determine where it'll go. And so it's, it's yeah. interesting that they're streamlining it in some ways. Yeah. And, and they, they show, they'll show you, you know, where the, where the pin is basically on that meter, but then you have to take into account the wind and the elevation and all these things. And there's no way to just to make a secondary mark on, on the power meter, which is how most games handle it. So you right. just ha- have to kind of eye it and figure it out. And I like that kind of fuzziness in it. Yeah. Has anybody checked out the battle golf mode? Not the speed golf, but the battle golf yeah. wacky arena speed golf thing. Yeah. I, I played one one match of that and I was like, I'm, I'm going back to speed golf. Because I've heard that's like it's the star of the show. Lot. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, I think, um, you know, it's funny that Jeff, well, it makes sense because it's, it's the title of the game, right? It's super rushed. Like you're rushing. You're sp- Oddly enough, like, and this is my first ever in my life Mario Golf game. Um, probably not my last just because of content. But um, I, I actually liked the more regular standard golf because the the con with the the rush for me is that it kind of takes off like i enjoy watching people like take their shots like even if it is just the computer and like kind of seeing it all play out and you don't get that as much with the rush so like i I feel like it's such a like a goofy criticism to be like the rush is too fast but it kind of is it kind (laughs) of like i'm in and i'm out and i'm a little disoriented and i feel like i don't get to indulge in the the nuance and the beauty of the game um that it does have with like the golf elements and the battle is somewhat similar i warmed up to it like i played with my brother and at first he like hated it when i'm like let's just try it again like let's just give it another let's really feel it out you know for like for, for the community and um i did warm up to it i think and there's two ways to play it you can play it with like elevation or without elevation without elevation it's a lot simpler because you don't have to follow paths um, but what's fun about it is that like it just makes it a little bit more chaotic and I feel like my beef with the rush the tr- classic rush mode or whatever where you're running is it's goofy but not quite goofy enough like I kind of wish they went a little bit more all out with some of the like wackiness of the game like I was expecting more 
ridiculous courses, like I don't, more of that like Nintendo Mario flavor. And I didn't get as much of that as I would have wanted. Um, outside of a few key moments, like the ultimates, I think are super fun. Like mm. you hit the ball and it turns to ice when it lands. Like I wanted more stuff like that because otherwise I'm like, well, this is just kind of like a decent golf game, but there are better games that do like golf better within like the video game realm. So then I feel like right. it doesn't. It didn't have enough Nintendo juice for me. Or even like Golf Story on the Switch, which is a very fun kind of story-based golf experience. I still had a really good time with it. I got to point out, that opening cutscene is ridiculously good. It is like a short film. It is I, the I most over-the-top yeah. thing. Uh, definitely, if yeah, you're it, not playing this game, check it out on YouTube. It is absurd. It, it seems like the start of like a Nike commercial <laughs> yeah. where, where everyone's in black and white and they're taking it very seriously. And then from that point on, it's like... Oh, yeah, this is just showing that Nintendo ha- is getting as far away from the core concept of golf as it possibly can. Yeah, that's like, hey, everybody, look, we're not just a golf game. I it's promise. actually focus time. Well, Jeff, I'm, I'm glad that you're having such a good time with it. You're going to be keep playing it throughout the summer, you think? Oh, definitely. All right. There it is. There it is, folks. <laughs> Take it to the bank. Uh, all right. We got to get rolling. So let's see. Could I have all three of you? Oh, hey, hang on. Oh, actually, let's see. I guess it would just be Kyle. Do you want to clap out? Yes. Okay. I'm clapping now. Here we go. Leo Vader, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's so nice to have you. How's your day going, man? Oh, really great. It's finally not 100 degrees for the first time in like a month. Yeah, my brain can't process it. It's so bizarre to actually have it be a little bit cold in the morning for my bike rides instead of just like, all right, I should get out there and I'm already dripping with sweat because it's working its way up to another 100 degree day here in Minnesota, which ain't normal. Um, Leo, I brought you on because you're an expert on so many things. Um, Assassin's Creed, living, a living Assassin's Creed game, poetry. No, I don't know if you saw uh, this news, Leo, uh, that... Jason Schreier broke, and then Ubisoft quickly posted something. Be like, yeah, 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 it's true. Just uh, stop reading about uh, the harassment stuff. <laughs> um, Assassin's Creed Infinity is the name that is a code name right now for... Didn't even say the next Assassin's Creed, I don't think, but it could end up being the next Assassin's Creed. This is due out in 2024 or later, and the idea is Ubisoft is, even more than they've ever done it before, combining their studios, taking... Ubisoft, Montreal, Quebec, shoving them together and saying, okay, now you all kind of just make a big living ongoing Assassin's Creed with a bunch of different options that we can plug into this one behemoth. We're here, everybody. This is the new era. It's like officially now open worlds are just going to transition to living worlds, I guess, because I don't know if you saw also that news earlier this week. Strong rumors that GTA 6 is also due 2024 at the earliest and that that's going to be a modern take on vice city but that also is that same idea of like we want to have vice city as the basis but it's going to be an expandable tweakable world but yeah does anybody have strong thoughts on assassin's creed going this big living game direction yeah i I don't understand how that's gonna work (laughs) yeah like, is it going to be like in Battlefield, how you can like pull up the tab on the left and switch between Battlefield games? Oh, weird. I guess I didn't think about it that way. I thought it'd be more... I mean, the obvious thing is they're taking a step towards the Fortnite direction, right? And they want to have these worlds that they can tweak on the fly. And so, Jeff, I saw it as like, they'll release this world. This is all speculation, right? All we know is they're making this big project called Assassin's Creed Infinity. But... They're making this big world and then it'd be like, okay, and then the Animus is being updated and now suddenly you can go to this area and now we're recreating Boston from the 1700s over here and then over here is going to be ancient Greece. And because it's wacky, already a game in and of itself in the Animus, they can just keep plugging stuff in and kind of fudge the logic. Right. But if you're not charging $60 for each of those, I don't understand how they expect to be able to fund these things. Like, like that's the part of the living service, like, or living service to me implies the game's going to come out. You may pay for it once or it's free to play. And then it continues going on. Maybe you can rope in like paid expansions into that, at which point it, it, 
that feels like a much more traditional Assassin's Creed thing with with maybe like like Leo said, that kind of like a menu wrapper that, you know, pulls them all together. But otherwise, I don't like everyone's saying, oh, they're going the Fortnite way. And it's like, well, Assassin's Creed does not work in a Fortnite payment model. At least I would precedent for it. I don't. Yeah, I don't know how that could how that could possibly work. It seems like they're stripping the one thing out of this series that's always kind of been an annual or biannual thing. Like the $70 is the part I would think they would want to keep. Yeah, so the official Ubisoft statement, they say, rather than continuing to pass the baton from game to game, we profoundly believe this is an opportunity for one of Ubisoft's most beloved franchises to, uh, sorry, I'm getting choked up, uh, to evolve in a more integrated and collaborative manner that's less centered on studios and more focused on talent and leadership, no matter where they are within Ubisoft. And Jason Schreier, his tweet, uh, where he tweeted out the Bloomberg story, uh, said details on Assassin's Creed Infinity are still in flux as it won't be out until 2024 or later, but it may be some sort of hub that allows people to play multiple AC games, both big and small. So maybe it is going to be a little bit more of that Battlefield model where you're still paying for these AC games. And like that big and small detail, I think is really interesting if they stick with that and they have like, okay, now we have Assassin's Creed Chronicles, kind of the 2D strange one yeah. in China, if like that is just going to be now a little area in the side that you can technically go over and pay for there. But if they have both studios working on this, you think it's going to be more than just a rapper hub thing here. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't I'm, be surprised if it was, like thinking about Hitman, Hitman 3 being a hub where you play three Hitman games plus all this different DLC. Right. Like just a better way to service what they're doing and like put it in front of people who would potentially buy it. Like I wouldn't be surprised if that's all this comes out to because it's hard to really picture what it would be if it was more ambitious than that. Yeah, thankfully they have the lore to kind of make it work, but it's kind of a bummer. <laughs> a couple things are bummer. I think it's it's a bummer to not have the big kind of shakeup of teams. I know it creates some inconsistency in this team and Toronto focuses on these gameplay aspects, this team in Quebec, but I like having that personality to the teams a little bit more and the idea of ubisoft a studio already known for throwing thousands of people on each game now to say but what if we threw two thousand people and it's just one ongoing game now like i like the personality difference and like at least taking a different bite of the apple from all these different creative teams you know every couple years yeah well, the gut it, reaction is that it's like a a loss yeah for creativity it's like you know going all in on the thing you'd expect the most to go all in on kind of unsurprising in a not fun way yeah and i also don't understand what that means for like modern day character lore oh in, boy like like if <laughs> if if you, if everything's going through the animus now who is the overarching character you know who's the desmond character like the the previous couple have kind of like they'd introduce a new character that kind of goes with that. And well, what, that, I don't know. what that is, is that's going to be an event now where it's like, okay, now it's the summer of modernity and everything will kind of zoom out and take a step back. And then everybody will be controlling the modern day world before you jump back into freaky animus time zone mosh pit. But who is that? If there's just one overarching series, they're hoping now. no one will ask. They're yeah. Like, People don't mind that this <laughs> is getting kind of muddy. <laughs> well, I think it'd be like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Leo, I didn't play too much of Odyssey, but it'd be like the Odyssey of Valhalla person, right? It'd be just continuing that thread. I mean, if potentially. I What I want is for it to be like Assassin's Creed 4, where the, you're the first person, it's you yeah. in Abstergo, and you're going to these different computers that have these different Assassin's Creed games on them and you <laughs> slide your credit card into the PC. <laughs> <laughs> now that's gaming. Uh, so Ubisoft, more than focusing on the game, because, you know, this is so early, they probably don't have a lot of the stuff locked down, uh, but they did focus on the teams and they pointed out that uh, there will be kind of a senior producer overseeing all of this. And then within Quebec and Montreal, they have two creative directors who are sharing the creative director spot so we have jonathan dumont who's the creative director for assassin's creed odyssey and immortals and then clint hawking going back to the far cry two splinter cell days of ubisoft uh, and he did watchdogs legion most recently he is going to be taking up 
as a creative director as well and going back to Montreal. So he's going to be also a creative director for codenamed Assassin's Creed Infinity. So it's kind of cool to have him working on Assassin's Creed, but this is kind of the larger problem, right? Like, oh, I would like to see Clint Hawking's take on Assassin's Creed. And even though he'll be the creative director of this game, I will not feel like it's Clint Hawking's take on Assassin's Creed because it's such a huge pool at this point. Especially hot off of Watch Dogs Legion, which had those cool ideas I was excited for from Clint Hawking, but ended up being delivered in a really diluted, safe way because it's just such a massive project that they need to minimize the risks on it, you know? So I'd hate to see that happen again. Yeah, and that's just the idea of playing any protagonist. Do you feel like they yeah, watered it down? Yeah, play as anyone, but it doesn't matter who you play as. You could beat the game with anybody off the street, even if they're not fun to play. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, and it, and each Assassin's Creed has kind of had its own identity, too, just with the places that you're going and the characters. I wonder if we're going to lose that, too, where Assassin's Creed Odyssey, above and beyond, kind of, like, there are a lot of mechan- mechanism changes in there yeah. as opposed to Valhalla. Like, are they still going to switch things up that much if it's all kind of under this same Infinity umbrella? Or, and, maybe, and then, or maybe... And is it like, okay, you're going to Boston, so here's what you're going to be focusing on, and here are the specific me- mechanisms for Boston. But then when you jump to Tokyo, now like things are completely different with how it plays. Like that, that kind of sounds like a mess. Or maybe I mean just that era of iteration in a big way for Assassin's Creed is over. Where I mean I remember doing coverage on the I want to say older Assassin's Creeds, but you know like okay, going from revelations to unity stuff like that where it's like okay here's how we've changed up climbing this way this way you have to hold this button instead of holding right trigger to do this and like maybe they're just at a point now where it's like the controls are basically locked down for assassin's creed and there'll be some features that'll differentiate but yeah i mean maybe there will be a cool avenue for more experimentation in this if we're if we want to be optimistic maybe some of those smaller pockets could just kind of have that create creativity of some Assassin's Creed DLC, but just surfacing that stuff for more people by putting it front and center here. Maybe, but mm-hmm. it's it's too early to be pessimistic, right, Janet? Sure. Okay. I'm not like, you know, I don't have a, a big stake in this other than that I'm generally more of a fan of single player stuff staying pretty, like what we expect from like a single player game where it's like I'm in, I'm out. And even if I'm in for 80 hours, like I'm out and then it's done. So even just like, the push for DLC and things being like a living world in that way. I'm just like, I just don't want to invest more time in one single idea. And I think this does have the benefit of like, oh, a multitude of ideas. But like, again, I don't know if I want to live here forever. (laughs) It seems like a big ask. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, it could still work. Could still work. I, I don't know. It sounds, it doesn't sound like what, when people do try something on Assassin's Creed, it is very much that like, singular identity of a few marquee games that are the highlight of the franchise so the idea of having like you know there's a reason that buffets aren't really that good but they can still be fun so maybe it'll be like that situation where like the food's <laughs> never that good of a buffet but you're getting a lot of pieces so it's like isn't it fun to get as much macaroni and cheese as you want maybe that'll be the gaming version of this mm, so okay. that's my hope for it yeah. it'll uh, be a buffet of assassin's creed all right i think that's fair but yeah it's just a good indicator the sign of the times i mean it seems like where the industry was going a couple years ago, and now it's even ramping up of just release these games as a platform. The platform will be Halo. The platform will be Call of Duty. I mean, Warzone is just going to keep growing, and maybe eventually that'll just be a one-stop shop. And if big franchises like Grand Theft Auto, in theory, that one's dodgy, but then Assassin's Creed are, are jumping in that direction, that seems like where we're all heading, baby. Just an ongoing singular platform. If Assassin's Creed wants to go live service, they really would do well to bring back the multiplayer. Totally. I think they yeah. should take note of that. I yeah, would imagine that's going to be a thing. Otherwise, it just feels like a weird one to try and do this because in my mind, at least, the past couple Assassin's Creed's were all so different from one another. Mm-hmm. And like they they changed significantly in the past couple of ones the, that... I don't I don't I don't understand how that works in a live service format where it's like yep, yep. we're going to we're going to create an update and this is going to add this new mechanism is it compatible with the older cities that older locations that we used to go to or is this completely different I think Leo's Leo's analogy of Hitman makes the most sense 
But at the same time, all of Hitman's seasons were relatively similar in terms of mechanisms. You were just adding new locations. Yeah, yeah. And one last thing, it's it, it's kind of a bummer too thinking about a studio like Quebec and a game like Immortals where it's like, well, I don't know how much development talent they're going to have for a game like Immortals then, which, you know, pros and cons to Immortals, but at least it was cool to see them try and do something new in between Assassin's Creed titles. And now if it's they're being assimilated into the Assassin's Creed Borg fully to sustain this thing forever, or at least for attempting a decade or whatever they're going for for this living platform. It kind of leads to fewer experiments from Ubisoft overall. But Assassin's Creed Infinity, everybody, let us know if we're way off and if you're excited an Assassin, as an Assassin's Creed fan in the comments because maybe I don't have a good read on where Assassin's Creed fans are at. Please show me the silver lining in this. I'd love to know it. Um, speaking of silver lining... Uh, Leo, you shocked the world earlier this week where you jumped in Slack and you said, I got a little game for you. It's called Takeling's House Party. Ever heard of it? <laughs> and everybody said, no, no sir. <laughs> Please stop talking to us about your VR freak shows. What is Takeling's House Party, Leo? <laughs> Um, it's a VR party game. Me and my friends were looking for something because we were getting together covid free baby and we were looking for an asymmetrical game we could play with like one person with the vr headset the rest with controllers you know and we yeah. tried a few of them and this was the standout by far takelings house party the premise is there's a couple games but the most simple one is one person in vr is in a little kitchen setting and the other people on controllers are playing as these little guys little colored guys running around the kitchen counter and hiding under cups and in the bread box and stuff and the person in vr is flipping stuff up picking up a cup and looking inside of it like lifting a pan to look behind it looking for these little guys and when he finds them he has to kill them by like stuffing them in the toaster or burning them on the stove or whatever it's not where i thought that was going <laughs> <laughs> there's like a bunch of different ways to kill them and it's so fun in both uh like either way yeah like when it's you're looking for them it's fun and when you are sitting on the couch behind them it's like you're looking at your friend and you're going when you know the vr person is looking the other way it's right. constantly like pranking this dude with a blindfold on is what it feels <laughs> like it's so many laughs came out of playing that and it has a really good party mode where you're rotating who's wearing the headset and like going for points because the takelings can also score points in certain games by like being a little more dangerous to collect things, but risking, you know, getting caught. Really, really fun experience. That sounds absurd. So it's basically like a Jack and the Beanstalk trying to trick the giant, hide from the giant type of thing. Exactly, yes. That sounds so fun. Yeah, I watched a trailer for it, and honestly, like, more than anything in the last three years, I'm sorry, Half-Life Alex. I saw that and I was like, I kind of want a VR headset. I kind of <laughs> want to play Take Ling's House Party. Oh, you need yeah. to be like hooked up to pc though right like it's like i have a quest like i'm wondering like what does this process look like yeah it's only on pc right now but you could hook your quest up okay yeah. then were people like sitting around like how did you have this set up for people to like play then we had the vr person standing in the middle of the room and then controlling people on the couch behind so they were kind of have to have to peer around the vr person but that you know just added to it anyways that's take link's house party um but in the complete opposite end of the spectrum uh janet you yes. love a game called chicory a colorful tale uh i just finished it and i really really loved it as well uh the developer greg labanov also uh worked on wonder song or created wonder song back in 2018 which was a favorite game of mine back then so it's amazing to see this new wave of success janet i'm going to try and describe chicory you tell me where i go wrong uh you play as a puppy dog in a world that's lost all of its color and you have a magic paintbrush and you're painting the world back to life, but effectively the game plays like a big adventure game like a Zelda. Yes, it is an adventure coloring book, as their Twitter bio describes. The point is, Chicory is a very good game, and we're now going to have a little discussion with the developer, Greg. Um, but before we do that, um, it's kind of like a Chicory-only party, so if you haven't played it, like Leo and Jeff, would you guys mind clapping out? Okay. Let's get out of here, Leo. Okay. Greg Lobanov, welcome to the podcast, sir. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations this on Chicory. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, it's nice to see you again. It's been um, a long time. And this is my first time meeting Janet as well. Hi, Janet. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. So it was like GDC 2019. I know it, it feels like a bizarre lifetime ago, but I think, I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was GDC 2019, right? Where I really liked Wandersong and then reached out to you there? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we hung out for like a little bit there. I think that's the last GDC that's actually happened, which is yeah. crazy now to think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, there's a lot to unpack here, but that was a big thought I had. Is like, boy, it feels like Wandersong didn't come out that long ago. And now Chicory, A Colorful Tale is out and uh, tearing up the charts, uh, Beloved, it's <laughs> reviewing like gangbusters. And it, it feels like this was a short turnaround for a game developer, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I guess relatively. I mean, we were working on it for about two and a half years. So it doesn't, and like, <laughs> you know, like compared to a normal person, or I don't know what a normal person, I guess normal people don't make video games. <laughs> but <laughs> like, like in the span of a human lifetime, two and a half years is a long time to spend on one thing. Um, <laughs> that is true. That is <laughs> That's more point. how I see it. But compared to other video games, yeah, for how, for, and for how big it is, it was a pretty fast turnaround. Yeah. Um, I've gotten, I'm, yeah, I've gotten pretty good at making games pretty fast, I think. Yeah. Basically. And, and part of that is just the tech because you use what game maker studio two. Uh, yep. I use game maker studio. It's like the software I learned how to make games in when I was like 12 or whatever. Uh, and now I'm just, it's like, it really is kind of like breathing to me. Like I can just use that and, and I can make stuff. And honestly, like if you look at wander song and chicory, um, like there's a lot of reasons why like game maker might not nece even necessarily like if you were starting from scratch if you were learning today to make games i don't know if i would necessarily recommend game maker for you to make those games right yeah. but it totally makes sense for me because like yeah like learning anything new adds like a year to any project and i don't have to learn anything new anymore so i'm just sticking to that <laughs> are you worried about it being future proof because uh, from the video editor side like i love final cut pro and i like clung on to it until apple basically kicked me off the train uh but like are you <laughs> is it future proof game maker studio 2 seems to be i mean we just got a playstation 5 like we we're the first playstation 5 game maker game like they're clearly interested in and in staying on modern consoles so yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of like there was a time when it seemed like it was going to be future proof. And a lot of my like ever, all of my closest friends are people who I met through game maker communities back. Yeah. When I was like 13 or 14, whatever. Um, and a lot of them left uh, when it seemed like Flash was getting really big and game maker didn't seem like it was going to be going forward for much longer. And I was like one of the very few people who just stayed on because I really didn't want to learn anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it paid off. <laughs> yeah, actually. it's got to be so yeah. nice to yeah know that like tech so well at this point but all right walk us through uh chicory's launch for you does it feel like a night and day difference compared to wander song maybe just compare the two and what it feels like to be at the center of the hurricane here uh yeah i mean like it um i mean in terms of like how excited people are wander song like like people loved that game a lot when it came out and i think i feel a similar energy from chicory to be honest yeah so my expectation with chicory was that like I was going to get way like people would wouldn't like there, there wouldn't be those weird people who loved the game as much as they loved Wander Song, but there would be way more of them. And instead, it feels like we have way more people who all love the game a lot, <laughs> um, which has been pretty, uh, pretty, pretty special, honestly. Um, but yeah, as far as like the scale of the launch and stuff, it is definitely like a big difference. Like Wander Song, the entire time, like like just everything about this this project coming from Wander Song was so different. Like. When I was working on Wander Song, there were so many points where, like, like paying rent was a concern. Like, I had to, like, you know, be like, oh, like, to the sound designers, like, I'm going to be a week late on this check because I'm waiting for something. You know, like, like that kind of stuff happened all the time. And, like, there were, you know, probably a couple of times where I wasn't even sure if the game was ever going to be able to be finished because, like, funding stuff and, like, dealing with publishers and whatever. Like, it was just always, it was always, it was always felt like it was just, just on the brink. Uh, and then... Like, and then when it came out, the launch for Wander Song was like, people love that game, but it definitely was quieter. Like it was not until probably like a year afterward where it started, it actually seemed like, oh, well, actually like we've, we're actually making money on this. Like, <laughs> and, and, and like, yeah, I'm going to be able to make more games and, and everything. Right. Um, yeah. So working on Chicory, it was like the whole time there was never a problem like that. It was always like, I know this game will be done. Like we have runway to spend way more time on this game if we wanted to. Like, 
like you know, it can work with almost anyone I want to like uh, and and make sure and I know like they're they're paid on time and everything like yeah that was great and then yeah the launch was like super like less stressful um, we even had like we had time to QA test this game that was new for me so like. <laughs> Uh, like we had way more people playing this game and way fewer bugs reported than with Wonder Song, and that's like, uh, yeah, this is like this is the first time in, uh, in my memory that I can say a game launch actually went well. Uh, Yay, <laughs> I can say that with confidence. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's just like yeah, it, it, it feels really different. So I'm like I'm definitely trying not to take for granted basically how lucky a lot of that stuff is <laughs> oh yeah you mentioned uh, having the freedom to like make you know more games and like work with like whoever you want like what do you what's your vision for the future do you think it'd be like a new i just keep trying out new ips <laughs> would you continue with this and then who like who's in your dream list of people to collab with well i guess when i say like work with anyone i want to it's more like like we could bring in people to do stuff uh so like on on wander song it was really like if i wanted to do something like I had to do it. Like there was no space to bring in someone to help me with something. Right. On Chicory, it was like, oh man, this is really annoying issue. Like we have to add like fonts for other languages. And I could be like, oh, I'll just hire somebody to do that. Like <laughs> no big deal, you know? Uh, so that, that's more like, it's, it's not really about like, um, you know, well, yeah, it's not like, oh, I could bring in Shigeru Miyamoto to design <laughs> or something. Like <laughs> it's not like that. And if anything, yeah. So like, um, I know people who have worked on uh, larger scales than me and like with bigger budgets and stuff. And I think I, I have a, a, a decent enough understanding to know that I don't want to grow my team size actually that huge. Like it's, and it's not like I have like, uh, yeah, like superstars that I want to work with. It's really like, I want to be able to work with my friends and, and people who I think are really interesting, like a small team of people that I think are interesting and just makes up that is, is personal and, and fun for us and like fun to work on. And I can still get my hands dirty on the parts that I care about. Uh, kind of thing rather yeah. than like trying to like build like a big studio or anything um i think that's that, that's like my my goal i definitely want to keep making games and i have um idea parenthesis s and idea or ideas that i want to do um that i'm like really interested in that i can't really talk about yet but uh yeah definitely like i want to keep making um games kind of in the same way that i've been doing because i think this is working really well for me now <laughs> that's i mean that's such an unbelievably lucky spot to be in as a game developer to be like oh it's getting easier and easier as i go along here and i'm seeing more and more success i mean you're at an amazing moment right now where i'd imagine with the success of chicory and especially honestly like at the end of this year you're probably gonna get another huge boost because i think it's going to be on so many best of lists and stuff like that that mm. i don't want to say it and jinx you by saying you're set up and you're in such a prime spot but like <laughs> I bet a lot of surprising doors will be opening to you in the game industry from this thing. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. It I really, it felt like that was, it's like funny because it, I felt like that actually did happen with Wander Song. Like, even though like, you know, it didn't show up on best of list. It didn't like exactly win awards, but it was one of those games where like, like even though like not, not everyone was buying it, but people who were reviewing games or running platforms, like they heard about it. Everyone knew that Wander Song was good. So that like when, like I announced Chicory, just suddenly there was like all these like doors just suddenly flew open. Everyone was like, "Oh yes, of course." Yeah. Person made Wander Song. Yes, of course I'll cover your game. I didn't cover Wander Song, but like, <laughs> like, like these these so many things like like happened that hadn't happened before. So it felt like there was like all of this like I don't know like groundwork or like I don't know what that is, but yeah, it, it felt different um, already. So yeah, yeah. How are you dealing with the? positive feedback i mean i know it's very easy to play the game and to read too much into the text and the writing in the game and be like oh these are all your feelings but the game deals with imposter syndrome deals with kind of you know the emotions of a creator and i'm just curious like what's your perception is now that you put that piece of work out into the world and everybody said two thumbs up great work artist <laughs> Uh, I definitely feel like i'm thinking a lot about how i wish it was better still <laughs> yeah uh, uh like yeah, I mean, it's it's um, how do I? There's 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 a lot to unpack there, I guess. Like there are there are a lot of personal like like you know things that are personal to me that are put into this game, but there also are a lot of things that like like this. It's it's not just me who's in this game, basically. Like I don't I don't feel like I'm on the examination table like emotionally. A lot of the time when people are talking about the game, I feel like a lot of it like 
it's a conversation that I can kind of have with someone else. And this game is like that conversation. It's not like, it's not me. It's, it's like this thing that we, we share, like a thing that's common between us. So there right. are things obviously that I relate to, but there are a lot of things in there that are not me that I know that, that are, that are, that, that are honest, like for other people, I guess, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. So like, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like scary in that way. It feels like a thing that I have externalized that I can talk about and that I can also see flaws in. Like someone can be like, you know, I think that part wasn't the best. And I'm like, you're right, you know? <laughs> I, I wish I had done better there, and uh, next time I'll try harder, you know? Um, yeah. I feel a bit of that. Uh, it, it is, like, yeah, honestly, I, I am I am surprised at how strong Reaction was, because, like I mentioned, like, I guess coming from, like, Wandersong, if I can compare, like, Wandersong was a game where, like, it's all story, it's all heart, and if you don't care about the story, then, like, you don't like Wandersong. Like, right. there's just no reason right. to like that game. Chicory was totally, like, I think that this is actually a solid Zelda game, and like, like this is why I thought the reaction would be is like, oh, it's a solid, fun Zelda game. Oh, and the story's pretty good too. Yeah, the story's pretty good. But anyways, like this puzzle, whatever, right? Like people would yeah. like it wouldn't be the thing that people cared about. Where instead, it feels like it was like a multiplicative thing where people were like, like the story ended up being the thing that made people actually fall in love with the game and like what actually makes it like a bigger thing to them. But I just expected that it would be overshadowed because, like in in Wander Song, like. I made a lot of um, intentional compromises like to the game where I was like, you know, I don't, I think this will play worse, but it's going to make people feel a certain way. That's going to make the story work better. And like, I want to have that moment in the game. Like I want this to be the game where I make those kind of sacrifices. Chicory was definitely a game where it was like, there were definitely times where it's like, no, I want to make a really cool game. And the story is going to like, try to kind of go along for the ride with it. Right. There are things and there, there are things where the story had to do a certain thing and the game had to compromise, but like not like Wander Song, there are times where the story had to compromise for the game to work somewhere, and I like that was different. I just expected that, that that would mean that people wouldn't like get jive with the story as much. But instead, it's like yeah, I think what I'm learning is that like gameplay really does a lot for people's perception of everything else. <laughs> so like even when the story isn't like the number one thing in your face right now, like people are still getting that from the game. Um, which yeah, is cool. I, I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Like just Janet, I don't know if you had this reaction too, but like listening to other people on other podcasts talk about chicory, it's a lot of talk about like, oh, it's really cute and you can draw <laughs> and you design things for other characters and you're like these cute little animals. And so I think it's easy to focus on that. And maybe that's just because people are focused on the opening, but I hear very few people explain it the way you just explained it, which is perfect. Like it's a, it's a Zelda game with a lot of customization. <laughs> it's, it's a Link's Awakening if you like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, Janet, yeah, I feel like it's like so many different genres. Like, yeah. you know, I, I saw so many different of my favorite games and like, I don't want to name too many of them for mechanical spoilers. Cause like <laughs> I was con I was almost constantly surprised by like the abilities you got. Maybe they were mm -hmm. meant to be obvious, but um, yeah, I just, it just kept like when I thought I knew what the game was, like just more and more layers revealed themselves, which I think is like the measure of something really special because I just was constantly <laughs> delighted and surprised. Uh, and I, I absolutely adored the game, but I am curious to know, you mentioned that, you know, there all you're kind of thinking about is like ways you could have made it better. And you mentioned, you know, I've heard some criticisms and like, yeah, like that's fair. What's a criticism you heard where you're like, yeah, I agree with it. And then what's a praise you heard where you were sort of surprised that people were drawn to like an aspect that maybe you thought was a little bit on the weaker end. Mm, criticisms I heard that I agreed with. Uh, so, well, okay. Like I, like, I think something that comes up regularly, like the, the boss fights, not being people's favorite parts. Um, and like, I, there are like things I, I, yeah, I guess the more, once I, the more I understand about what people's actual experience with them was, the more like when you're working on it, things seemed really good. And then once you actually like, yeah, it's just hard to tell sometimes because totally. even playtesters, like like a lot of people, their favorite parts were the boss fights. That's actually probably still true mm. for all the players who actually played the game. Um, but so I, I'm afraid I'm almost afraid of saying too much because I almost like don't want to poison. Like it's like if someone really likes the game, I don't want to like tell them why they're wrong. Like you know? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like like in some ways, I wish that I had we had been more creative, uh, like with how we handled basically some things. Like I think boss fights were a really good idea in a lot of ways. Um, but they're like, like, could, could we have done something more creative that like fit better with the themes of the game? Maybe like, I don't know what that is right now, but mm -hmm. like, you know, if, like I, I, I like there's, there's some, there's some feeling there like, Oh, like maybe I didn't think through enough or, or have a good enough idea there. Um, not everyone like, this is this is way more ephemeral, but I, I like like there are a lot of people who like play part like only play some to some part of the game, 
and they have a feeling, oh, the story is going a certain like because it's dealing with a really um, personal subject, like with like anxiety and characters' depression stuff. It's really easy for people to get a takeaway from it that is not what we intend, or you know, they they play only part of the story and they think like, oh, like this character is the bad guy because they're depressed or something. Um, that that kind of thing, like that kind of read, like it. It's it's hard to avoid when you're when you're doing stuff like this because I know it is really personal, but it's also just something where like. I don't even know if that's a thing we could address. It's like it's, it's tough because you, especially because you're uh, working like in in the structure of a game. Like there's certain you know like there's just things with pacing that like you know I can't just sit here and give you text forever, right? Like I have to yeah. give you game. Like the story has to move forward, and like there's just parts of me that like like feel like ah like it's just too bad I guess that people don't always get the thing we want from it, and I wish that like there was space to do that better or to to give everyone like to actually like explain you know the people the, the way we want it to feel. I don't know. This it's it's like really fiddly. It's like really weird little fiddly stuff like that. That's hard to I don't know quite have a pin on yet. Um, and 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 no, I guess that probably covers it. <laughs> there's a lot of this like it gets into weirder and smaller things. Just like feeling could have been better. This could have been better, kind of stuff. Um, praise that I was surprised by. Uh, I I think I think honestly I was I was honestly surprised at how much people connected with the 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 characters in the game because like so i i obviously i i i do creative stuff uh as a as a career and so like this stuff is really like this is like the the conversations in this game the stuff this game's about it's really like really like me talking about like my my life and my job and how i see the things that i do um and i just didn't expect that to resonate so strongly with so many people and i think that's partially why i didn't expect the you know, like the people that have, you know, that, that strong personal connection to it because Wander Song is a game that's like super global and it's about stuff that feel like just like just even in summary feels so much more general. Like it's about optimism and like, you know, like trying to bring together community and stuff. And this game is like literally like you are an artist making art. And I just like I know that there are a lot of people who do that stuff, but I was, I guess, surprised the extent that it feels like so many people have like a leg or like into that into that world and that story and a an angle that it makes sense to them. And so when people praise the game's conversation of that stuff, uh, like it, it, it did surprise me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to. Most of my PS5 is screenshots of dialogue at this point, where I'm like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this because it's kind of spoilery anyway, so I don't think I want to post them. But I'm not joking. I have like dozens of like, I'm like, that's good. I even like did the 15 second record to go back and later get the dialogue screenshots. Yeah, it was fantastic. And you think just like as a creator, Janet, you think it just strikes a chord with a lot of people who are dabbling in that space these days? Yeah, I mean, I had so many like fr- like people like message me and talk about like oh like I want to know what you think and then you know they're saying that they resonated with it or talking about um, you know without giving too much away like how the themes ended up speaking to them and what they feel like their role and their craft is and then I mean it was just it it just hit so many of the times and like there were so many things that were just highly relatable in a way that managed to not also be like too on the nose because I've, I've definitely you know, had those moments in games too, where it's like very direct and I'm like, okay, I get it. You're against right. capitalism. But here it's like it's so much more <laughs> subtle or explored that it feels, it does feel like, you know, a conversation with peers more than a game trying to give me a specific message. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, I was really struck by just what Chicory says about the evolution of game design, which is maybe too big of an umbrella for this, but just like the small things of just like your health during a boss fight it's not really going to be an issue. Like, yeah, we'll reset you maybe a little bit, but don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, there's going to be some puzzles. If you get stuck here, you can call your parents and you have the option of them basically just telling you exactly what to do. Except for one time, which I really loved, the dad trying to explain at some point the answer to a puzzle. And he goes, you know what? It's complicated to explain. Just go look it up on the internet. Because <laughs> it's like one screen to the left, two up, and then you go over here. It, it, just forget about it. But I'm just curious about your thinking about just what is necessary in a game these days you know it's like well you don't really need the challenge of a boss fight you don't really need these deep puzzles like give people the option to keep progressing and there's no downside to it i think it's incredibly smart uh thank you yeah i think the the um like the philosophy that is in the middle of all those things is basically at least for this game it's like we my intention was to make something with as little friction as possible right and that's definitely not the intention of every game out there and lots of games are really good because they have so much friction um and that's that's like yeah so that's also a super valid great way to make a game but this was a game where i guess like 
I, I, I hate making games. I hate watching people play games when they have friction in them. And I've made those kinds of games before lots of times. Um, it's just really frustrating as a designer when, you know, like someone's dying over and over again, they're getting frustrated. And like frustration is even like, uh, yeah, it's like a feeling that I think some people play games to, to feel. Um, but I don't like giving it to people. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess it was, it was just a, a question of like, yeah, like just try and, and some, like in some, in a certain light, I almost feel like I backed away from a fight because it's like, like games can be really cathartic when they put you through frustration. They really make you kind of like hate yourself and then you get through it and you're like, yes, you know, like you conquer the thing. Um, that's great. Uh, my, like my close friends made like Celeste and it's a game that's like exactly about that, you right. know? And like, that's great. And I find that so, that's such a scary, that is a designer, a very scary thing to get into because like when you, when you give players those experience, it's like you're, uh, you're, you're, you're kind of making a promise or like you're, you're building up an expectation or a promise, right? Where like, I'm going to treat you like and you're going to feel good at the end of it, right? Like, that's the promise that you're basically giving them, right? Um, and like, but to actually fulfill that promise is really hard. And I would say probably most games that do that don't actually fulfill on that promise. So you just feel like at the end. Um, <laughs> so like, I would say like, like for me, partially it was just like, rather than trying to, you know, to, to, give you this, you know, like, make you feel like and then promise you're going to feel good at the end. I just want to, like, make something that, like, I can promise that you're going to feel good while you play this game. That's a promise I can make, and I know how to deliver on. Uh, and, like, and everything was kind of built around basically trying to support that idea. And I think, like, this is, this kind of connects to the um, the trend right now of, like, wholesome games. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which we get, we get lopped into a lot. And I don't, I don't really feel that, like, that word really describes like everything that's in this game very accurately but i think that what that actually like the reason why that term exists the reason why there's an audience for that stuff is because there's a lot of people right now who actually want to play games that are like frictionless like that right they don't actually want to get stuck and not be able to finish the game because they they're playing it not they're not playing it for that part of the experience they're playing it to know what's going to happen next or to experience a world or meet these characters or you know engage with a theme and like i think the less the game actually kind of puts obstacles in your way like the like um, you know, the less you're like, you're thinking about like how to push this block or how to jump this gap or whatever, the more space there is in your brain to engage with like, you know, oh, what do I think about art? Like, <laughs> like, it's really interesting what that character said about like the history of art and or like colors or whatever, like, right. you know, like you're, you're, you're engaging at a different level that um, is probably more like where I want to engage players with. Um, so that's, that's why we do things that way. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. It was really exciting. God, was it summer game fest? I think where uh, Shio Yoshida came on screen and then showed off Chicory, like it's <laughs> amazing to have like the support of PlayStation. Uh, what has that process been like for you so far? Uh, pretty like shocking to yeah. I mean like so we signed with um, Finji as a publisher like early last year and uh, like so <laughs> I, I didn't actually deal like directly with Sony and the way a lot of these things would come to us would just be like. Sony says that they want to sign you as an exclusive PlayStation game, which was like mind blowing. <laughs> uh, again, coming from Wonder Song, we're just like stuff like that would never even happen. But it's right. like, oh, brand new console, and they want you to be like their like 2D indie, you know, like face of the console, like exclusive thing. Like that was crazy. Uh, and like, uh, uh, um, uh, to be honest, okay, so I didn't actually know who even who Shuhei was until this year. Like, what? I'm really embarrassed. I'm That's really forgiven. sorry. Because I, 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 they were like, oh, like, Shuhei. Yeah. <laughs> Shuhei Yoshida's like a really big fan of your game. And I was like, okay, cool. Is that like someone at Sony or something? And, like, <laughs> 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 and then I like, did a Google search and I was like, oh my God, like this is a big deal. Um, and like, yeah, the extent to which he loved our game was like, like I don't know. I, I, my my heart like was cracked in half like multiple times. Like when he, he said like his whole Twitter page to be like all chicory brand and stuff. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that. that was really sweet. Yeah. Uh, yeah like it's like, like irrespective of who he is and like his stature in the industry and stuff um like separate from that just just for somebody to like really invest so much in, in our game like i i you know i i like it, i guess this is a very chickery thing but it was like you know i was like <laughs> like i know you you know it's literally just like five of us making like a 2d like game maker game you know like <laughs> in my house like <laughs> you know like it's, it's not like just some ratchet and clank stuff you know like, <laughs> <laughs> like you don't have to you know like take it that seriously shuhei or like you know it's just an indie game um <laughs> but That's a yeah lifestyle. yeah 
Um, so yeah, there definitely, definitely some like, I don't know, tension or, or, or friction there of just like that, that like feeling of like, wow, like people are really taking, like, this is really going places and then people are really, yeah, the, yeah, it, 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 I, I still haven't totally wrapped my head around, I guess, like how much like <laughs> big stuff there is out there for our, what feels still to me like very little and, and personal game. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I just think it's interesting like in, you know, the last couple of weeks, there's been some stories about, uh, PlayStation could be courting indies better have they lost some of their indie charm and then it's like well if you're if you're in the fence it's very good but the challenge is getting in that fence yeah yeah absolutely like i feel really lucky to be on on this side like i've been i've been i've been on the other side of it too i know how that felt the yeah part of what gives me that like i don't know like i guess i called survivor's guild because i remember how much it sucked i remember like back when it was really hard to get on steam i didn't have games on steam and i was like like struggling in the green light system like wondering like how i could get valve's attention even publish a game on steam and how much that sucked and like (laughs) yeah Yeah. so like uh, yeah being being on this side of it like all i think about is just how hard it it is for you, you know the past me and and other people who are still living in that life and yeah wondering i guess like how how we can bridge the gap better. Um, <laughs> yeah. What do you, I mean, do you have any but, advice? What, what should people do if they're trying to get in the spotlight a little bit more? Um, I mean, like I, I, I honestly don't have great, like, like, like the reason, I think the reason why I am where I am right now is because we started early. Like I just spent years sucking at this and making <laughs> no money from games until like I met enough people and was around for long enough that eventually like, you know, just one door opens at a time, basically, right? Yeah. So that was my route. That's obviously not a route that's available to everybody. Uh, but that was that was that was my route. Um, so like, if I was starting from scratch right now and I was trying to get like, you know, how do you do that? I'm not totally sure. I mean, it seems like the only way that like I see like like little known games suddenly blowing up is when the concept like they have really good art and like a really cool concept that's basically like a really famous Nintendo game, but with a spin on it or something. And like that, that game will blow up easy headline. Uh, Like that seems like, yeah. Right. Like that seems like that's like the way that games get really big right now. So I guess do that. (laughs) But yeah, I got, it's, 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 it's feels, it honestly feels random. It feels really random and it feels really hard. And um, like, like it's scary to me to imagine that. But I mean, on the other hand, I have to say it's probably easier to be a startup like indie game maker than it is to be a startup like indie movie maker right now or an indie musician or an indie comics artist. That's interesting. So like if, if you, if you have the the time and patience to learn how to make games, you probably, you know, like you le- that is already a leg up on, on doing a lot of other different creative things today. So yeah, at least there's that. Cause I have friends in those industries too. And like, yeah, we talk about this a lot. <laughs> Indie books, like, oh my goodness. Like, where do you start? Just, yeah. My yeah. God. Uh, well, hey, Chicory, A Colorful Tale. I don't want to freak you out, Greg. It's Janet's game of the year right now. Yes, it is. It is indeed wow. over Bravely Default 2, which wow. was no uh, easy feat. But yeah, I, I absolutely adore it. Um, and, you know, I'm definitely not alone in that. You talked already about the, the Phantom It's Hat. I saw there's that account that's at Play Chicory that someone made that just lists <laughs> reasons to play the games. I know you follow it because I see you on the yeah. list. And I just think that's so wholesome. I'm like, this is my secret alt account. It's not literally, but it totally <laughs> would be because I am a self-proclaimed Chicory stan. Um Two, because I know, you know, we're going to wrap up. I have to know, uh, though, Greg, what is your favorite brush in the game? Mm. Oh, uh, my favorite brush in the game. So I want to, yeah, I mean, it's a boring answer, but I really like the halftone ones, to be honest. There's probably, there's the, yeah, one of the, one of the ones that has lots of dots in it. I like that one because if you overlay them, then you can kind of, it feels like you have kind of like semi-transparency and that feels really cool. Uh, (laughs) Those are probably my favorites. Um, But the spray pan, the spray can is actually really good too. That one's actually like a surprisingly good way to just like make drawings look like they have texture. Uh, like <laughs> just doing a quick pass of spray can over stuff. Um, I like that stuff quite a bit myself. Uh, yeah. I feel like I feel like I have a whole Boring world. Answer. No, I feel like I have a whole that world to unpack here because like I just finished the game literally like an hour before we started uh, the podcast here today. Loved it. Wow. But now I feel like okay, now it's game on. Now I can go check out all the fan art because I'm sure that Reddit is just blowing up with like the most amazing paintings. Conceivable. Yeah, if you if you browse our, our Steam, if you go to like the Steam page and go to the Steam community yeah. thing and scroll there, oh my god, like there's so much good stuff there. That's where I've seen a lot. I okay. haven't seen Reddit yet. Okay, cool. I got to check it out. Uh, well, Greg, uh, congratulations, man. Really, uh, hats off uh, for a tough two and a half years. Congratulations <laughs> to you and the team. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, 
yeah, I, yeah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's out on Steam, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, and is there, what can you reveal? Is there a window of exclusivity, or it's just, it is exclusive to PlayStation right now, winky winky? Uh, what is the, what is the official line? It's like, yeah, I think, I think we have nothing to announce at this time, I think is what I'm supposed to say. Okay. So that's what I say. <laughs> All right, message received. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for joining us, man. You're welcome back whenever you want. Awesome. Thanks very much. It was great talking to you. Yeah. Uh, and this is dumb, but would you mind clapping out then? Yes. And then should I also, am I, I'm going to hang up after I do that, right? Just to, like, <laughs> yep. You got it. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. All right. <laughs> Hey, welcome back, boys. Nice to see you. Looking fresh. All right. Janet, do you know how this whole thing operates? Yeah, I believe it's a place called Patreon. That's right. Jeff, um, and Leo. It's patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. You can go there and support us at any tier. We appreciate it. If you enjoy this type of content, you can support it or join it over at patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. And thanks to our biggest supporters. If you support us at one of those higher tiers, we'll read a plug for your passion project on the podcast. Let us know if you have any questions about that. There's still slots for the month of August. We're going to jump in there. But thanks to people like Crypto Zookeeper, who wants everybody to know that Hello Hyrule is the premier Legend of Zelda travelogue podcast. In each hour-long episode, we take a deep dive into a new location in the series, in timeline order, and ask the hard-hitting questions like, what was this dungeon built for? What does a Deku Baba taste like? And seriously, what is going on with Hyrule's economy? Whether you're about to revisit Skyward Sword with the upcoming remaster, or you're visiting Skyloft for the very first time, this podcast is the perfect travel companion for you. So grab your sword and your sunscreen, because tours are open today here on Hello Hyrule, available wherever you find your podcasts. Hello Hyrule is not responsible for any food poisoning except while listening. Also, thanks to our dear friends, I am 8-Bit. They want everybody to know about the Sea of Thieves triple album. If you've been enjoying Sea of Thieves, you want to celebrate the Sea of Thieves in style, you can check out the triple island colored vinyl. Tropical island colored vinyl, may I point out. It has a pop-up papercraft center label. It's sweet looking. It has music by Robin Beanland. So check that out in I am 8-Bit's wonderful online store. And anything in the store under $100, you can use the promo code BOTTLEROCKET. All one word bottle rocket for 10% off help support i am 8 bit because they support us and they're very generous by shipping out a prize to the minmax community every single week this week we're going to go through all of these questions which have been submitted over on patreon.com slash minmax with two n's leo the deal is anybody who supports us at any tier can submit a question and we choose our favorite question and then that person wins a prize and this week it is the fantastic vinyl soundtrack to ape out one of our favorite games from the last couple of years. Uh, so get ready for yeah. that. How did they decide the canon soundtrack for that again? Well, only the question of the week winner will be able to find out, Leo. Wow. All right, here we go. Victor Pham writes in and asks, Hey, everybody, what does it mean for a game company to be anti-consumer? Is Nintendo anti-consumer for charging $50 for a slightly larger OLED screen and an Ethernet port that should have been there from the beginning? Is Sony anti-consumer for charging $10 for the PlayStation 5 update to Ghost of Tsushima? Big question. What is anti-consumer these days? Hmm. It has to be not good enough of a deal to be perceived as anti-consumer. Um, I'm a big proponent of, like, pro-consumer is a lie that companies trick you into believing so that you can get excited about buying products or supporting their brand, uh, which is fair. You know, we're all playing the game of capitalism here, so I'm not, you know, no judges on that front. But, you know, it's like, oh, it's pro-consumer because there's a sale or like, you know, Game Pass is a great deal. It's pro-consumer. It's like Game Pass is a strategic strategy to get more consumers and make money. Like they're not doing it from, you know, I, I think to a degree we all make things because we love art and love making things. But we also like need money to live. So there is that balance and like people play that really well. So I think the thing is like when you have pro consumer moves, it's really just like a good something that will that the consumer can get excited to buy and support. Like it feels like a good deal. But then also, obviously, you're making money off of it. So it's good for you. Um, versus anti-consumer, I think, is when it when it feels like wait a minute, I don't know if I'm really getting a lot of this. I don't think you can kind of like it's like the 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 screens go away and it's like you realize i think they just kind of want to make money like when you know playstation right. was gonna they allegedly were gonna oh it was, or xbox was gonna up the price of something like that was a recent thing that's right the xbox gold thing there was that that yes. flash in the pan 
So that's like, oh, that's anti-consumer because you're charging me more money. I don't see what I'm getting out of this. Wait, you just want to make money to live. This is just a this is just a business. Right. I thought we were here because we loved games. Anti-consumer vibes. Pro-consumer. Ooh, the, so it's now free to play games like you don't need gold anymore. When really it's like that's actually still from the same ideology of people are mad. Let's get people to like this. Let's keep people to play. And then maybe they'll get other stuff. So and I think that's basically what those two lines are. Right. It's all obviously to make money but it's just a matter of it's all a facade right you're here first i mean naturally right but then it's just a matter of is it doing it in a way that's pissing off your audience blatantly yeah and is it is it infringing on you like consumer rights have been a thing for a long time and there there are certain rights that have been stripped away in like the digital only space where like yeah. you no longer really technically own or legally own a game you you're licensing the right to play it you can't resell it you can't you know do whatever else with it make copies of it or whatever and though and i think the the companies that come down harder on that are the ones that get labeled with the anti-consumer label more often yeah something like no drm on a download from uh the good old games or whatever that's that's something that's pro-consumer Something that is doesn't benefit the company, but does benefit the consumer. Yeah, I guess that's a good way of looking at it. There we go. Uh, Raymond McDonald writes in and says, what is the most affordable way to game? I'm an all console gamer, Xbox, Switch, PS4, and a decent PC. I've wanted to upgrade something that and could have and could have, but the reality is the cost. Right now, the game's coming out across platform. The ones that are next gen exclusive to me are not can't missed. Not can't miss. Please try saying that, everybody. Um, I want a PS5 for the exclusives, but Xbox is my daily driver, and with Game Pass, I can't see spending the money on a PlayStation 5 plus $70 games. My perfect solution for me is to game on PC from Sony, but that seems far-fetched. Am I really wrong to think next-gen not so much right now? <laughs> There's a lot going on there, Raymond. No, I don't think that's insane to think. Jeff, um, for example, may I reveal yeah. reveal the, the full curtain here, what's going on behind our curtain? Uh yeah, is why well, I, there, I, I just had, went. There was an opportunity for Jeff to get a PlayStation Five, and he said, "I'm good. I'm actually fine," which blew yeah, my uh, mind. It did. You said that, and I was. You were puzzled by my response, and I was puzzled by your response to my response because <laughs> uh, uh, one of one of the community members, very nice, had had gotten basically an extra one and was offered to sell it to one of us and he was going to do it at retail price, which was all also very nice because you could totally jack that thing up. It'd be anti-consumer. Um, yeah, <laughs> it would It would be anti-consumer, yes. But when I was thinking about it, it was like, I, my, my logic was two parts. One is I really hate that there's this scarcity, even if it's not really Sony's fault at this point, but they could certainly do better with like getting in a queue in order to get you know, a console when things are available, but I hate this whole, like, I felt like a drug deal, like a drug addict when you brought it up. And it's like, Hey, there's a guy there's, you can, you can go meet him with like $500 in cash in some parking lot. Yeah. It would be great. Score one of these because everybody wants one and everybody needs one. It's like, you know what? Like the exclusives aren't there yet. I I'm fine. Just waiting and not buying into that whole ecosystem right now and you didn't want to be stabbed i guess i can understand that but okay but to raymond's question like what is the cheapest way to go if he has a decent pc and you already have a switch and stuff like i i don't know game pass and an xbox one right now honestly seems totally fine to me yeah i i think it's i think it's game pass i think it's looking at the d like weekly deals on switch are amazing a lot of times and then like like humble bundles on PC yeah. is I I have hundreds of PC games and I I feel like I probably spent like five dollars on them. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's like two hundred dollars over the past couple of years of not realizing that I'm kind of leaking money on these bundles. But but totally it's I mean, it's also Epic Game Store getting those free games. If you go back and look at every free game they've given away, it's mind boggling at this point. And yeah, Steam sales. I mean, PC, and then if you want to push it, Game Pass on an Xbox, and you will be drowning in games. It's truly yeah. anything but getting a PS5. That's the <laughs> highest end of right. the money you could be spending. Yeah, that's true. I guess if, unless you have zero PC and want to go to a high-end one, of course. Yeah. 
Uh, Tanner Hoisington submits a comment over on Patreon and says, My gaming phrase, pet peeve, was given a boost last week when Nintendo released the, quote, Quality of Life Skyward Sword trailer. I don't know if y'all caught, caught this, but basically everything annoying in Skyward Sword is going to be eliminated with this version, which is fantastic. It's Anyways, nice. um, I've always found that to be a hokey way of describing minor game improvements. I even decided to check what the other official Nintendo account subtitled this trailer. And I don't know if he's translating it or it was in English, but basically he says quality of life isn't used in other countries. Here's how Nintendo phrased it. So for this quality of life Skyward Sword trailer in Japan, it was called Commercial 3. <laughs> In Germany, it was called Improvements to the Game Experience. In France, it was Comfort Improvements. In Italy, it was Improved Functionality. Russia, Enhanced Features. And Spain and the Netherlands, Various Improvements. As far as I can tell, we Westerners are the only ones saying this quality of life. How do you feel about quality of life updates? Are there any other gaming phrases that irk you? Tanner, I like it. I like quality of life as a phrase. I think it. I think it's good and descriptive. Yeah, it's, we know what it means. Yeah, I think that's true. But I think it's also been poisoned by companies when they don't have anything else to put in a description for whatever update they're doing. Where it's it's probably like we're fixing this one bug in the back end, and and we have to push out an update that you're going to have to download. So we have to put something on it, and we'll just say quality of life. <laughs> I guess that could be. Yeah, various enhancements. Is that the various improvements? Well, I forget what the Smash update. So just uh, say various was. bug fixes. Yeah. Like that, but but it's not, Switch is a master at not putting, Nintendo's a master at not putting out patch notes. Right, exactly They're, that. Uh, like, but why don't you tell me what you did? Who wants to know? What are these quality of life improvements? Yeah, but Tanner, I think you're out on a limb. Quality of life is fine. You just said right? who's asking. I'm like, this is kind of aggressive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, sincerely, Eric writes in, and ask Jeff, um, you, have you beat Red Dead 2 yet? No, I haven't. Okay, cool. But I reviewed it That's on true. Show Plus this past <laughs> That's week. That's right. So. On Twitch, you can use channel <laughs> points good. to make us do a 30-second video review. So people were forcing <laughs> Jeff to review it. Uh, he gave it a scathing review, by the way. is out of this world. Uh, yeah. My name is Dan. Says, pretty crazy that the game of the year has pretty much been decided for me. All right, everyone. Let's give a round of applause to Chicory. Well done. Much deserved. Oh, see? Janet isn't crazy. Yeah, uh, I wrote in as that person. Oh, cool. Congratulations. <laughs> so she is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> White Mex writes in and says, Hey, Mexi pals, what are some things that are ubiquitous in media, but you haven't seen in real life? <laughs> Mine is punch. I've never been to a party that has a giant punch bowl filled with a red liquid waiting to be spiked. You haven't lived. Yeah. Most parties that I go to have a giant red punch bowl. I think that's a good one. It's not that often, but what is it? Like, what's number one punch location, you think? Wedding? Boxing ring. Box. <laughs> Don't. We got him! We got the jokes today, everybody! Um, My thing is probably, uh, like, high school cliques and bullies. Yeah, I feel like I never encountered that classic high school experience. Yes, it I think that's such a good one. Like the bully pushing books out of somebody's hands as they're walking down the hall. Like I, of course there were bullies. Of course kids are monsters in school, but like that classic Hollywood stereotype of a bully, yeah. I have never seen it done in a way where I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember that in our school. Uh, it's always just this absurd over the top. When I think in reality, it's a lot more subtle and cruel and emotional, I think, than just the, the crude bully. And now it happens online, of course. Oh, well, that's right, Leo. Um, let's see. I think mine is the people getting high and looking at their hands. That still pops up in media the, <laughs> to this day, and it blows my mind. <laughs> Um, and being hyperactive on weed, dancing around in the breakfast club. Yep, yep, there it is. Uh, Joe Kafchinski says, I have a standing bet with a coworker on whether the Switch Pro or a new Silent Hill will be announced first. Did I win or did I lose? Is his question. <laughs> Does this count the Switch oh, OLED as the Switch still, Pro? It's still TBD, no. I think. Yeah, yeah it's still TBD. We okay. don't, neither has come out. Okay, there it is. Uh, GoFish says, I might be upgrading to the new Switch even with how underwhelming the new features are. Cohorts, what are your favorite stories of irresponsibly spending money, gaming-related mm -hmm. or not? 
I when I first got a job, um, and this is a this is a warning story. It's a cautionary tale <laughs> to mm. anyone listening who has not gone into credit card debt yet. Um, for you have not lived until you've been in credit card debt. So when I was like in, in college, I had a credit card and I would like rack it up a little bit, and sometimes I pay so it off, but not really. And in my head, this is so dumb. I was like, it's all good because when I get my job. As an adult, I'll just pay it off like really quick because I, you know, we have a setup and yeah, everyone does finances different. But in my household, like you get, I think the first six months after you graduate, you can live like without any bills, like in the house still and everything. After that, it's like, okay, either pay rent or if you want to get your own place, obviously you can. But you get six months, no one's going to ask anything. You Love can it. look for it, but you also need to find the job. So yeah. it's kind of, there's a bit of crunch there too. Uh, I get my first job at the teaching gig. I'm like, cool. And as soon as I get the job, Discover's like, yo, we got like an extra one, two K on your card ready to go. I was like, bet. We went to Best Buy, pulled up. I got a PS4. I bought another controller. I bought No Man's Sky. I bought Bloodborne. I probably bought like 2K because my brother wanted to play 2K. And I was like, yeah, like we got, oh, let's spend it. And I like <laughs> maxed out whatever they gave me that day. And I had, you know, come to the, the PS4 late. This was like post 2016 because I'd graduated college. And I was like, yeah, we're like, we're going to game. And I took a picture with it. It was like my own. It was DIY Christmas. I loved it. Um, also, I was not good at Bloodborne. So that fell off. No Man's Sky wasn't as good as I thought it would be. I took a lot of L's that day. Uh -huh. But then like the, so that, that was it was glorious when it happened. Um, and we could end it there. It's just a glorious story. But the next part of that is um, my the school I taught at was understaffed and they like knew that when they hired me and just it wasn't understaffed. It was under like enrolled. And they technically hired me not knowing if they could keep my job. But they didn't tell me that when they hired me. Oh, so I no. got laid off. And now we have all this debt and a PS4. And it's like, why? Um, and it, you know, it was just like Damn. it was simultaneous glory. And also, like, I just think about how I'm still paying for that goddamn PS4. And I have oh. a PS5 now. I have like a whole different life. And I'm like, I'm still technically a little bit paying for that PS4, but it was fun in the moment. Not the best idea. Yeah. Ugh, that's brutal. Well, mine <laughs> mine sounds lame and tiny in comparison, but I'm like, I don't really spend money on stuff. <laughs> I'm very, very tight around that's the edges there. Go. I think so, yeah. And so it was like last summer, I splurged in a way that I haven't splurged in years where uh, I like in building out like a little arcade main cabinet thing. You know, we've talked about it a thousand times where I play a bunch of arcade games out at like my parents' lake place. Um, and I really wanted to go all out. And so I went to a neon sign shop in Minneapolis and they had uh, a neon beer sign that is like the, in the shape of Minnesota, but it's like, you know, big size. And I really wanted it. And it was $300. And everybody said, you are insane. If you spend three hundred dollars on a stupid neon beer sign, I said, you know what? We got those government checks <laughs> rolling in with the pandemic. This is going to be it. This is how I'm going to stimulate the economy by buying this neon sign, and I did it. And Leo, I think it was too much money for a neon sign, but it looks cool, you know. Can I just say thank you for stimulating the economy? Did you feel it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. I noticed something changed. <laughs> Stop <laughs> pulling them out of the bed. Um, how big is that sign? It's like, it's good. It's like the size of Minnesota. I don't know. I, size of my arms now. I don't think you, I don't think you overpaid. Neon signs are expensive. Well, and that's, what, well, that's what I thought. But then I went on Amazon and looked up arcade neon sign and they have like a bunch of really sweet ones for like 74 cents, basically. Like, are oh, they okay. actual neon though? I don't know. Maybe. Also, those Where? could like catch fire if you don't do them right so i feel like you went the right route okay professional that good beer too. sign yeah maybe you're right but apparent apparently like neon is so expensive now because of the pandemic that like neon sign makers aren't doing neon anymore like they've they're switching to like basically making cutouts with leds behind them that gives kind of the same effect but you don't have oh. to deal with the, with the gas and stuff why is so that could be a that could be an expensive vintage sun. Why right is there. the pandemic affecting neon? Because it, it affects everything. I, I don't know where you get neon gas, but apparently that has skyrocketed like everything else. What is it, made out of wood? These are modern economy jokes, everybody. Mm. Hang on. Thank you. And look, wow. it's, it's no it's no punch joke, but we're all trying. Hey, hey, look at this. JG Kazimpour writes in and says, Hey, Benny and the Cohorts, what are some games that you guys thought were going to end up being a bigger deal than they actually turned out to be? For me, it was Fracture on the PlayStation 3. 
The ground formation guns were so much fun to mess around with and the in arena style PvP multiplayer maps. Games you thought were going to be huge and then weren't. Huge in, in what sense? Um, a bigger deal. I think culturally, sales wise, the whole kit and caboodle. Hmm. Mine is the one that I. I feel like I'm still the only one who brings it up all the time, and I apologize for it, but I'm bringing it up again. That's Red Faction Guerrilla. Yeah. Like, that game was so amazing, and I thought, like, this is it. Open world destruction. That's going to be the new thing. Like, they're going to make more of those games. Other companies are going to jump on that bandwagon. We're going to be in this heaven of, like, (laughs) physics-based destruction in all these open world games. Yeah. And we just got, got one lame sequel, and then no one else has... Still, I do it again. Yeah. Still, no one. It's, well, we got the remastered edition, but I thought you're going to go with uh, the old chestnut of Evolve, which I know people often bring up for yeah. the press. Like, what was wrong with the press? Why were they hyping up Evolve in such a big way? But that was a game that, yeah, playing at the studio with a dedicated group that knew what they were doing, that was like some of the most fun co op gaming. I've ever had in my life. And then yeah. it came out and I don't even know if I booted it up once it came out. And it just was such a dud. It was a bummer. So so I'm rooting for Back for Blood from Turtle Rock to see if this can be their big redemption story. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, thanks. Uh Titanfall 2, obviously. Titanfall 2. Yeah. It's had a bit of a resurgence lately. Yeah. But still, I mean, you play that game and it's just the peak. It's just the best of online shooters I've ever been. And best shooter campaign, yeah, all in one. I feel like with Titanfall 2, this seems insane, Uh, but during my favorite documentary, eh, is this true? Probably, of all time, like the Double Fun Adventure series, the most heartbreaking moment of that is when they released Broken Age, and it does about what you expect double finds broken age to do once it's released like that yeah, it's fine adventure fans seem to like it and then everybody moves on and there's this bummer moment where they're talking about like the sales numbers for broken age and somebody in the double find studio just goes could we just like launch it again <laughs> and it's so <laughs> sad but i really honestly feel like if ea came to their ea play stream at the end of july and said we're launching titanfall 2 again Here are all these reviews. Look at this. Look at how fun this thing is and just really lean into like, this is the relaunch of this amazing game. I really feel like they could make a gazillion dollars. And it's not $60, it's eight. Right. Everybody, it's stupid not to play this. Let's take clips of Jeff Gersman raving about this thing. Everybody who's ever played it um, has fallen in love and declared it their new religion. There's a reason why, everybody. Yeah, or, or just remaster it like yeah update yep. it for the new you're right consoles. that's a smarter way to go yeah <laughs> add maybe like add one or two more levels of like the reality switching ones that everyone loved be like this is 2.5 please buy it this time titanfall 2 director's cut bam playstation 5 xbox series x do it get it on switch Apex legends colon titanfall 2 <laughs> <laughs> yeah some feed the door um uh, yeah it's fun to try and think of other games that I was like really banking on like I thought dreams would be a bigger deal than it was. Um, I thought that Telltale's Game of Thrones was going to be a bit of a talker like Walking Dead was. And I'm still not convinced that anybody else on Earth other than myself played that game because <laughs> no one has ever talked about it. Minecraft was another one where Telltale got that. I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? This is going to be huge. And Maybe I just don't hang enough with enough hang out with enough kids, but I've never heard anybody talk about the Minecraft Telltale game. Uh, Stadia, I was very bullish on Stadia, thinking it was like, well, I think this is a really sweet option for people who don't want to buy a next gen console. They just pay sixty bucks, they can stream this thing. Hell yeah, a lot of people are going to be playing Red Dead that way, and it turns out not really. It yeah, I mean, it, certainly it feels like people don't know about it as an option still like people outside yeah. of our space right right well if only google had a little reach with their advertisements right. um and then that tech and free-to-play game on ps3 anyways sean mills writes in and says is the era of the auteur game director over 
It feels like new games being announced are marketed as coming from development teams and not from a single director. Do you think it's po do you think it's a positive thing for the industry to focus on developers as a whole team instead of focusing on a single director? That's a great question. That's probably a, a good point. Yeah. Um, I would say, yeah, we're moving away from it, but I think there's still that that opportunity in the indie space. Right. Like, I think we'll have our Jonathan Blows. Yep. Lucas Pope. Probably not our David Cages. Well, maybe that for other reasons, yeah. But that the, sounds okay. <laughs> but the sort hideous. of. Eh, it's a little myth, too, I guess. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think... I think it's nice to have a little bit of a mix. Like, I think the pro, and I think especially, like, the indie space is a good thing to point out. The pro is, like, getting to know, like, developers on a more individual basis and kind of, you know, the way you know, I don't know, artists in a band and things like that and can recognize them and their work, especially as, like, in this industry, people move around so much. Like, it can be kind of nice to, like, know, okay, this person worked on this project that I liked and all these other elements of it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's also always positive to be reminded that, like games, even when they do have like that big name that you associate with it, are always made by a team of people and aren't just this one person's vision. Um, I think a lot of times we do end up even, you know, here casually on the, on the shorthand and just mentioning, oh, yeah, so and so's game. But really, like it doesn't fully speak to what went into it. And I think, you know, that that has its own dangers because then like they'll go to make something else and you're like, oh, it's going to be great because that one name is there. I'm like, yeah, right. but that one person was in the context of a team and a studio and a whole other thing like that, that Kickstarter is not automatically going to work out. Yes, that is the perfect example. Yeah, is the Kickstarter. Well, we have the one name. Um, yeah, I'm really trying to think of like the AAA auteurs that aren't just kind of legacy. You know, kind of like within the last five, ten years, the names that have really boiled up. And it's like, Yosef Ferris, I guess. I mean, AAA enough, yes. Um, yeah. Like Sam Barlow, but that's kind of... 10, 15 years, I suppose, is when his his name has kind of been bubbling up. But has there been one? Like Jeff Kaplan or something? But like he's been around forever. But I'm trying to think of like, I guess, I don't know if you consider Overwatch his, like, is that an auteur game from Kaplan? Yeah, or is that just no, a recognizable he, I mean, name? He's, he's just kind of been the spokesman for yeah. it. Yeah. At least that's how it feels in terms right. of Right. And it's an interesting distinction between like the auteur versus spokesman. But there is a yeah. subtle distinction in there. I don't know, yeah, let us know if you can think of a good AAA a tour recently. Horace J. Hollingsworth in the Backstage Pass chat has a good indie one, Bennett Foddy. Yeah, that is another good, yeah, indie space That's is certainly... That's probably more likely, yeah, where you're going to find him. Yeah. Uh, Jim Chatterton, won't stop chattering, and he wrote in over on Patreon, I just moved from New York to Michigan last week, and I know a lot of other members of the MinMax community have moved or are moving shortly. What are your moving horror stories or your advice for the moving or post-move process? Oh, post-move process. Yuck. I feel like I never stop moving. Mm -hmm. Like I move all the time. I think I was trying to count in my head right now. I feel like I've moved at least like five or six times in my life. Like from my, I went from childhood home to like college, if you want to count that. Eh, not, yeah. not a big move, but whatever. Uh, then back to another apartment. And then like we had like three or four, like I've done at least like seven apartments, I think, in Jesus. the last like I don't know, 10 years, seven years or something. I think the first thing that comes to mind is if you can afford it, I've never had this, but movers, I dream of having, like, I just, I, I just, that's, that's all I want. That's why I know I made it in life when I yeah. can hire movers to help. But if you, you know, on a more, I guess, like financially chill end, um, having like a suitcase specifically for stuff that you want that first day slash that first night so Smart. that you don't have to frantically be like, I want to take a shower. Where are the towels? Oh, are they in the bathroom box? No, we use them to wrap like this one fragile item that didn't, because especially too, you got to know the realities of moving. Like we all have that plan of this is my my stuff or my clothes in my room. But at a certain point, you're stuffing like socks in between controllers. And, and then you have like these items that don't fit in a box. And you're like, just throw the yoga mat on with the umbrella. Like, <laughs> how do you pack an umbrella? I don't know. No one does. I've never figured it out. You can't. Um, so I think those elements, um, for sure, just having a box, like a, a suitcase that you can just, you're done, you're tired. There you go. Um, as well as like a food plan, you know, based on hours, like just, okay, we're going to pizza from somewhere. Like you're not going to cook that night. Like, right, right. Don't make it as easy yep. as you can. Smart. I, I'm with you on the movers thing. I did it for the first time with my most recent move and it's, I could never go back. Really? And honestly, like, yeah, I was lighter on money and it was nice because, you know, all my friends were moving. We'd help each other move or whatever. But 
my god it's a life changer because <laughs> you're still exhausted at the end of the day <laughs> like it's still enough to do in one day without having to carry it between vehicles yeah and everything uh this is i wish i knew what they were called uh probably just straps but uh dave clap he might be listening uh as tim would say uh, best buddy dave um he helped me move this last time and he had like these straps that you like put around your shoulder and you run it under a couch. Jeff, do you know these? And then you like lift the couch by having a strap between you on either end of the couch. Complete game changer if you can't afford movers and you actually want to move your own stuff. See if you can find these straps because just having that thin line underneath everything heavy and putting it on your shoulders instead of trying to lift it with your hands is just night and day. Yeah, my my parents had a have like an antique stand up piano, like one of oh. the ones that's about as tall as I am. And they had it in their basement for years and they wanted to move it up to their second floor and they had to hire a mover because it would be freaking impossible to move that thing. Yeah. And my mom said like a 50 year old kind of old guy showed up by himself and he had some of those straps and she said she's he strapped that piano to him and walked out the door and went up the stairs outside and moved the whole thing by himself what i can't i can't even imagine it that's that thing's absurd so huge. uh all right what do y'all like for a question of the week i like the ubiquitous one ubiquitous ubiquitous uh how's everybody feel about that do it. Do it? All right. Congratulations. Like used ubiquitous in a sentence. <laughs> there we go. Congratulations. White Max, you win the Ape Out vinyl soundtrack from I Am 8 Bit. They will ship that out to you. Thanks to everybody who submitted a question over at patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. Uh, now it's time for something we like to call Get a Load of This. Leo, you've been on a roll. People have been raving oh. about your Get a Loads of Thises. So please, wow us, dude. Get a load of these. <gasps> Ooh. Um, somebody, this is kind of a weird one and not along the lines of what I've done the last couple of weeks. So sorry. But it's a, in Watch Dogs Legion, speak of the devil, somebody found uh, Walter White from Breaking Bad. And I, it looks like an Easter egg because it's so perfect. But nobody had found it before. You know, this is the first image of it online. And surely it must have turned up if they coded Walter White to be a semi-popular spawn so people would notice the Easter egg or whatever, because not only is he named Walter White and looks like Walter White with his goatee and his baldness and everything, but he has um, the trait, or his bio says solicitor, which is like, <laughs> <laughs> he's the one who knocks, you know? That's and it also says he's infertile, what? which he isn't, but is, you know, maybe kind of a chemo thing. So, okay, either just randomization is too much for the human brain to comprehend or Ubisoft are brilliant and they somehow could seed this in in a patch for like one player somehow. Right. Or this person used the new appearance changing software to make the hair look like it and the face already kind of looked like it oh. and the bio happened to match. Okay, that's still good. I like it. Still good. That's fine. There's a link below for all this stuff. Uh, Jeffum, you got a cool one? Uh, no, I don't. Great. But get a load of this. This one may make you throw up in your mouth a little. Great. Uh, it's a Gizmodo article um, that is entitled, Zuck Wishes America a Happy Birthday in the Most Cursed Way Possible. Um, and it's it's about Mark Zuckerberg's Instagram post for the 4th of July. And it's him surfing on like a self-propelled surfboat on a lake <laughs> while holding an American flag. And uh, going to John was is it a John Denver song or something? But and and then and then of course there is a boat undoubtedly off camera of like an entire Facebook team that has to go around with him and film him doing these stupid things. Uh, and the art the article includes humorous replies that people had of like he someone it told him to act normal on Fourth of July and this was his attempt because he's. A, <laughs> robot uh but then it also posts to like apparently he's been doing this on instagram a lot of like it's like a 
geeky billionaire's attempt to like what he thinks would make him look cool to normal people because right. he's been shooting like arrows at bowling pins and what? doing a bunch of other ridiculous things that that he thinks are cool. Um, so you can check that out and wait. He's been shooting arrows and bowling pins. Apparently, that sounds yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Leo. That's like, what cool people do, right? I may be cool. a normal guy, but Manly that sounds cool people. to me. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I wish I would have been a billionaire and shoot so many arrows. <laughs> uh, that's good. Links below if you want to see it. Uh, Janet, you got one? Yeah, get a load of this. Um, on TikTok, this woman had posted about her, the proposal her boyfriend did, you know, like marriage proposal. And it is a basically a Star Wars trailer for like a fake Star Wars film because the thing is the proposal. And it's incredibly well shot. It has like two over two million likes, like who knows how many views on TikTok already. It was posted a day ago. And it's just incredibly high production. And my favorite element of it is in the trailer, it includes like friends and family members playing these different characters and oh, I don't I have no idea how they shot this whole thing but I'm like this is a Star Wars film that we deserved and didn't end up getting but it's it's really well done uh and super cute it is a little cheesy for a proposal like I'm not a, the biggest fan of like the super cheesy angle proposals but this one's so well made yeah and I'm like you can do whatever you want this is just this transcends any any anything and the crazy thing is this person made it to try and uh propose to their partner but the person didn't end up seeing it. And so they had to send it in to this podcast because they know that the partner listens to this podcast. And then when they click to get a load of this link, if you're listening, your name is at the end and it's a proposal for you. So everybody get ready that for that. That is how it works. Yep. Hey, I get a load of this. I had a weird thing this weekend where um, my mom was just like, hey, do you want your grandpa's old watch? She's like, that seems like a cool thing. Yeah, I think I'd like that. And so I went home this weekend and I got a box and it was filled of like my grandpa's old rings and, and watches and stuff. And so I was digging through this box and at the bottom there was an envelope and it said sent to uh, my grandma and grandpa's name in 1957. I was like, what the hell is this? Why is this in here? Opened it up and it was a Christmas card signed by JFK. And I was like holding up to the light, like this is really <laughs> JFK's autograph. Like, what is this? And I, like, my grandpa used to work uh, for the Department of Agriculture, and apparently, back when JFK was a senator, he sent him this Christmas card. And grandpa hung on to it. So then I went down a rabbit hole of trying to research, like, how much is JFK's signature worth? And it came to this: uh, there is one person who has clearly the most valuable autograph on planet Earth. Does anybody have a guess for who has the most valuable autograph? And it's because apparently only six of this person's signatures have been found. Jesus Christ. Jesus. Yeah, he signed. He That's signed a lot of stuff. Guess too. Good guess. <laughs> anybody else have a guess? Uh, Thomas Jefferson? No, it's not Thomas Jefferson. But boy, that'd be sweet, wouldn't it? Tootin' Common. It's not, ooh, Pharaohs is an interesting, that's a good idea because maybe they like, you know, have a hieroglyph on a brick somewhere that they like pulled out and stored. But nope, it's more recent than that. But not more recent than Thomas Jefferson? Uh, <laughs> I think it's... It's Zuckerberg with that American flag. It's Zuckerberg. Surfing through. It's older than Thomas Jefferson. Is it bigger than the bread box? It's bigger than a bread box. <laughs> King we got Henry the Eighth. I'm gonna get it, Jeff. Um, do you want to keep going, Jeff? Leo? <laughs> this is the no. rest of the show. <laughs> All right, it is William <laughs> Shakespeare. Shakespeare's autograph sure. is apparently worth twenty million dollars. Is that insane? Anyways, fun stuff. Excuse uh, me, I have a signature to counterfeit. <laughs> <laughs> oh crap! You said it out loud. Uh, did you pull one from the community in the Discord, Leo or uh, Jeff? Um? I did. Uh, get a load of this. It's a short and stupid one from that flow state of Fernway. Uh, it's a tweet <laughs> from... <laughs> what? I don't know how you pronounce it. It's a tweet from Seth Rogen. And he says, Once I was in the spa in a hotel in Vegas getting a massage. When I finished, I turned over and to my shock, Paul Rudd was massaging me. <laughs> he saw me go in and convinced the masseuse to let him take over, thinking I'd notice immediately... I didn't, and Paul did the entire rest of the massage. 
<laughs> I love that. I feel like fifty percent of your uh, get a loads of this have been about Paul Rudd, Jeff. It's all we Paul support Rudd. it. It's, yeah, it's, it's always my good. weakness. Yeah, someone someone figured out my exploit. <laughs> there it is. Uh, all right, uh, plugs. Let's see. We have Min Max Plays coming up on Thursday, where we stream new games or games we want to play every single week. Sir Pazorski streams uh, streams on Tuesdays. So you can follow us at Min Max Show on Twitch. We'd appreciate it. Leo, are you streaming this Thursday, dude? You bet your bippy. What's it going to be? I'm going to stream the opening of Mass Effect 2 live reaction. I am so excited for this. So we did the deepest dive in Mass Effect 1. Uh, things are relatively fresh for Leo. He does not know anything about, realistically, Mass Effect 2 or 3. And so if you want to see somebody check out the opening. We're building it up too much. But the opening of Mass Effect 2 for the first time, you can check it out on our Twitch channel. Leo, I don't want to freak you out. I am absolutely going to be watching that. Just as a person. I don't want to be on the stream with you. I'm just going to be watching as a fan. Just as a person. Just as a regular human Joe on the, the other side of the computer ever. screen. That's right. It's going to be fun. <laughs> uh, so we appreciate the follows over there on Twitch. Um, also, we have Trivia Tower coming up quick. It was kind of a late one last month and an early one this month because of our guest. Uh, so Trivia Tower is happening this Monday, July 12th. That is our big video game trivia competition for everybody in the community. If you support us at any tier, even that $2 tier, just one month, you can jump in and win a free game code, including a game code for Wandersong, which is the game from the creator of Chicory that we talked about a thousand times on this episode, um, or Scarlet Nexus. And the last person standing wins an Astro A40 headset. So if you have been learning a lot about video games your entire life and you want to put it to the test, you can join us this Monday at 7 p.m. Central, July 12th, we'll be joined by Imran Khan, dear yes. friend of the show. He'll be joining us for Trivia Tower. Um, also, we have, oh, that reaction stream for the Sony State of Play on our YouTube channel coming up on Thursday as well. Um, Janet, you got anything you want to plug? No, I think I'm all right right now. I mean, check out my Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash Uh I think this, because there's not as much stuff coming out other than like there's monster Hunter stories but i don't think i'm gonna play that i'm finally gonna continue it takes two yeah with my brother i think we're still like two streams away from finishing it that's right where it's i'm at it's been too. taking a long time but we're almost there so <laughs> come check that out uh, and see what we think uh now that we like we've lived inside that game basically yep that's fair leah you got anything going on oh uh, just chilling my man youtube.com slash leo vader got a the hot new video coming out within the next week or two cool that sounds I'm good excited about it awesome thanks so much everybody for watching or listening if you're watching this on youtube you can always subscribe to the podcast version of the min max show it is not patreon exclusive uh, but you can get early access to it every single week one day early if you support us over on patreon and if you're listening to this and you want to see our faces you can go subscribe to MinMax's YouTube channel. We appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who has joined the thank you crew over there on Patreon, the $50 tier, to have their name read out every episode. And also we send them a custom thank you video, so it's a two-way thank you street. But thank you to Hello High Rule Podcast, I Am 8-Bit, Mirko Rico Terreno, Beaten Down Brian, Zachary Pliggy, Andrew Yukowitz, Jawar Hello, Mark Seliga, PrettyGoodParenting.com, Connor McCabe, Ludwig Roque, John Higby, Chris Logan, Andrew Valla, Logan Krauss, Spiral in Your Eyes, Drew Waranis, new name everybody, Clint Farley, Spider Dan, Purebred Number 6, Star Killer, Steve Bamdad, Slick Nick, and Pritham Yarlagata. Thanks so much everybody, be good, have fun, let's go! Yeah.